Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second Culture Meets Policy conversation in Justice System in conjunction with the exhibition Howard Dina Pindell, Rope Fire Water on View at the Shed through the end of March. My name is Solana Tetman, and I'm the Director of Civic Programs here at the Shed. I am a Latina woman with short, curly, salt and pepper hair, in a red sweater coming to you from my living room, surrounded by some art and some plants. Um, I want to start the evening by going through a few of the forms of access that we will have tonight. In the bottom of your window, there's a button that says live transcript, where you can find real-time captions. We also have American Sign Language interpretation um, that should be visible at all times. And we have finally asked all participants to share visual descriptions uh, when appropriate. At any point tonight, if you have any questions, comments, or if you need any additional support in order to fully enjoy the program, please feel free to contact us through the Q&A button, also on the bottom right of your screen. I'd like to thank and acknowledge everyone who made this program possible, including the Ford Foundation and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support of the commission and the program, as well as the Howard Hillman Foundation for providing the Zoom platform that we are using for this evening's conversation. I also want to thank our co-presenter for this series, Wicksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, and introduce Sensele Cooper, their program manager, so she can share a few words. Thank you, Solana. Warmest greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. Thank you for being here. I'm Zenzele Cooper, the program's manager at Weeksville Heritage Center. Weeksville is an historic house museum, site, and cultural center in central Brooklyn that uses historic preservation, education, and a social justice lens to preserve, document, and inspire engagement with the history of Weeksville one of the largest free black communities in pre-Civil War America. Please visit weeksvillesociety.org to stay in reach and to learn more about the center and the work that we do. I hope that everyone is well uh, with running water, something to eat um, and safely indoors. I wanna send my love and prayers to my own family members and the other folks in Texas who are suffering right now, going without these basic human necessities during these very frigid conditions. I want to give a big thanks to Solana and the SHED organization for the gracious invitation for Weeksville Heritage Center to be a co-presenter in these very important culture and policy uh, discussions in collaboration with the gut-wrenching and glittering rope water fire exhibition by our dear sister and the giant Howardina Pindell. Howardina, if you're out there, we love you. We thank you for your courage and tremendous contributions to the culture, and you have a home at Weeksville. Thank you to the amazing women who will be our speakers this evening. Thank you for your commitment to transforming our communities to make our world a more just, equitable, and humane place to live, love, and grow. I did not describe myself, so I'm gonna do that now. I am a brown skin sister, um, an African born here in the United States. I'm wearing a head wrap that's multicolored with corals and lavenders and blues, and I'm more wearing a coral um, sweater. Uh, and I have coral lips. Uh, please enjoy the program. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Sensele, and thank you for that warm welcome to everyone. I echo all of that. And I just wanna say over her nearly 60 year career, Howard Dina Pindell has been such a trailblazing and inspiring artist, curator, activist, educator, and um, definitely her um, current exhibition at the Shed is a testament to her talent and commitment to both the now and fight racial violence in our country, as well as to meditate on and celebrate beauty and joy. And in a context where a global pandemic where and a broken state have put a magnifying glass to the increasing inequalities in our society, particularly affecting Black Americans and BIPOC communities broadly, at the Shed, we felt it was crucial to create the space to have some key conversations where culture workers and activists, thinkers, policymakers could share their work, be in dialogue and 
as I say, if all goes well, share some hope and thoughtfulness on how to continue building a socially and racially just society. I don't want to take any more time today because uh, I want us to use every minute to hear from these amazing, amazing speakers that we have, who I admire so much, and I thank so much for uh, participating today. So I'll introduce tonight's moderator, my colleague and friend, Prana Reddy, former director of programs at A Blade of Grass and the Queen's Museum. Thank you, Prana, and thanks again in advance to everyone for participating and joining us tonight. Thank you, Solana. Um, uh, as Solana said, my name is Prana Reddy. Um, right now, I am speaking from Rockaway Beach in Queens, New York, on Rockaway territory. And um, I am a South Asian woman uh, in a kind of office space with some framed art and some red lipstick and uh, a kind of South Asian shirt, embroidered shirt. Um, I just wanted to go over a little bit of the format uh, of the conversation today. So I am going to be presenting a couple of questions to each of the presenters in turn individually, uh, just so that we have a background on their incredible work. And then we're going to have a conversation all together. I'll present some general questions to anybody who wants to answer them. And I'll also try and incorporate the questions from the audience. So feel free to put those down in the Q&A. We'll be collecting those and I'll try and incorporate them into our conversation the best uh, way I can. Um, so without further ado, oh, one other last thing <laughs> before we jump in, I'm very eager. Um, to get the speakers on. But I want to emphasize that while I may be referencing the work um, of organizations that the panelists are either currently working for or have worked for in the past, I'm addressing them, these questions to panelists as individuals and their answers are to be understood as their own personal opinions. So um, I just wanna make sure everyone feels free uh, to speak from you know, their eye. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Sujata Balega's work is characterized by an equal dedication to survivors of crime and the people who've caused harm. And uh, a former public defender and victim advocate, she is a frequent guest lecturer at uh, numerous universities and conferences uh, focusing on restorative justice work. And she was named a 2019 MacArthur Fellow. So Sujatha, I want to kind of lay some groundwork with you first. Um, we have lots of data to show how the criminal legal system is failing us, both in terms of actually creating community safety on the one hand and actually doing any kind of repair um, for, like I said, either the people who are harmed or the ones who are doing the harming um, and rather providing punishment um, in general as the only form of um, uh, on offer of as a response. So somehow this is something we know isn't working, but we collectively seem to have trouble imagining a world where this isn't the system. And um, I wanted to ask you, since you've been devoted many years of time to developing new models for restored, restorative justice as one of these alternatives, um, how does restorative justice shift the existing paradigm? What's so different about it? And what evidence can you share that it works? Sure. Thank you so much for this beautiful question. Um, and uh, thanks for having me be a part of this beautiful panel. Uh, so I just want to start by saying I'm speaking to you from Berkeley, California, which is uh, unceded uh, Muwekma Ohlone territory, uh, the indigenous people that lived here prior to colonization. Um, and I need to start by naming indigenous people because they have been so many different indigenous people have been my teachers in uh, my work in restorative justice. Um, so uh, that feels important to start with that. And then with regard to my description uh, of myself, so I'm a South Asian woman uh, with salt and pepper, very big wavy hair um, that's long. And um, I'm wearing a pink and white uh, kurta, which is an Indian, a long Indian shirt and a gray shawl. And I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf um, that's got both uh, some books and objects, including a big orange Buddha behind me that peeks out from time to time, um, wearing a gold nose ring and some silver jewelry. So, um, so maybe it's good to take a brief step back and name what restorative justice is maybe as a starting place before talking about how it operates as a paradigm shift uh, in the way in which we can think about 
wrongdoing and harm um, in our communities. And so uh, the, the basics of it is the idea that, um, and in the way in which I, I like to work is in lieu of the criminal legal system. So operating uh, in, uh, not in as so much in tandem with it, but as circumvention of the criminal legal system. Uh, we bring families, facilitators of restorative processes, bring families, communities, individuals um, who've caused harm together with the person who's experienced the harm for face-to-face -face dialogue and collective decision-making um, where there's a conversation with everyone present on both quote unquote sides uh, about what happened and what needs to happen uh, to move forward in a good way. Uh, how do we move forward in a way that meets the needs of those who've been harmed and the people who've caused harm, uh, holding everyone's humanity sort of in equal importance. So, um, uh, so there's a lot of preparation that goes into this work. Um, and, you know, this is fundamentally a very different way of thinking about harm. And uh, one of my teachers in restorative justice is a man by the name of Howard Zare, who uh, comes from Mennonite roots. And so it's not just indigenous folks, but it, if, I think if we look back far enough in all of our cultures, we can find this notion that people can come together to heal harm, right? And some of the, what we call Plains folk from where I grew up um, in rural Pennsylvania and uh, the East Coast folks, uh, Amish Mennonite people, remain very close to old and ancient traditions uh, within white cultures, right? And Mennonite culture is one of those. So Howard Zare is a seminal thinker in this work. And he uh, really frames restorative justice as a paradigm shift. Uh, he says, instead of asking as we do today, what law was broken, who broke it and how should they be punished? Uh, restorative justice asks instead, um, who is harmed and what do they need and whose obligation is it to meet those needs? And what's the collective process that includes family and community in solving that, right? So that's the, the fundamental um, shift. But I think on a deeper level and a much more important level uh, in a way is this um, a paradigm shift beyond the binary uh, to leave behind notions of us and them, uh, victor vanquished, uh, guilty, not guilty, uh, and to allow for much more complexity in the way in which we resolve harms. And um, at the deepest level, in a sense, it's best characterized by this word Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U, which is a Bantu word from uh, the southern parts of the African continent. And it means uh, I am because we are, or a person is a person through other people. And so um, on a very personal level, right, I know this to be true for my own life. Uh, I was sexually abused by my father, and that's what brought me to this work, um, because the criminal legal system didn't have on offer what I needed to heal. And so, um, and so this is so true, and I think most literally about my father, I am because he was, um, both in terms of the suffering that I've had in my life was because of the traumas that he endured in his that were unresolved. And I think that that's true on the individual and collective level. And so in terms of data, what we know is that after starting a, a, a helping communities across the nation start restorative justice diversion programs, we started collecting data and we're seeing varied results of, of, of um, shaming the criminal legal systems in efficacy comparatively, right? And so one of the studies that we've done here in the Bay Area, um, the San Francisco area is um, showing a 53% recidivism rate, reoffense rate for kids who, who are going through the criminal legal system for identity. At identical crimes to those um, that were diverted to a restorative justice program. There's a 13% recidivism rate. Um, victim satisfaction rates are hover around 90, 92%. Uh, so what an empowering thing for survivors to be able to hear directly from the person who harmed them. Um, yes, I did this and how can I make this right? And to have that be collectively acknowledged and held um, by the people who matter the most. So that's um, a little bit about the paradigm shift in the way in which I see it. So um, you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, the models that you're thinking about are not um, part and parcel of the criminal legal system. And uh, why is it that it's better that it's not part of the system? And mm -hmm. what does it mean, you know, to communities to own this process instead of having it be something, you know, administered through the system itself? Sure. Well, on a very personal level, and particularly in the work around uh, child sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, which is more of the work that I'm doing now, um, I, I, the vast majority of crime survivors do not contact the system. The vast majority of us do not. I myself had zero interest 
in anything that the system had on offer, right? I didn't want my father locked up. I didn't want potential immigration consequences for my family. I didn't want, um, uh, you know, to be taken away from my family, uh, put in a family that didn't speak our language, eat our food, practice our religion, right? Um, so if someone had asked me what I needed, I would have said, help my family heal. I would not have said, you know, bring down the hammer on all of us and separate us. And um, so I think that that's the number one reason that, you know, any justice that's going to really help us un un um, unpack what is happening in so many of our homes across so many of our communities um, and in so many of our neighborhoods, it needs to be a non-punitive lens. Uh, and so um, that that is the primary piece on a very practical level. And then on a deeper level, I think that we've lost a lot of faith in our systems, right? When a system has shown itself for decades and decades and decades to produce, you know, incredible racial and ethnic disparities, um, and, and, and is an abject failure even so many of us believe that the criminal legal system is operating exactly as it, it was as it was designed to do, right? So the 13th Amendment makes extremely clear that uh, mass criminalization is an extension of slavery. If you just read the plain language of the text, it's right there. So, um, so but even if we believed its stated goals of you know rehabilitation and uh, deterrence and all, we see that it's not actually succeeding in any of that uh, to the tune of billions and billions of dollars, right? So. Why, um, why would any taxpayer think that this was a good product to be investing in? If it were on the private market, it would have failed ages ago. Um, so these are some of the reasons. Um, but at the deepest level, again, I think that restorative justice operates uh, with, with uh, shared power and, and the deeper empowerment of folks who've both caused harm and experienced it. And when it is the state that is operating with power over sort of forcing people into restorative processes, it's not restorative justice to my mind. And so that's why it's deeply important, both um, on these practical levels, but on this uh, deeper fundamental, what is restorative justice? Uh, it needs to operate um, at the level of family and community. That's what makes it power uh, in a sense. That's what makes its power so effective. Yeah. And I, I remember reading somewhere that you also talked about how the system itself doesn't promote truth telling. You know, when there's kind of legal consequences that are bearing on people's heads, it doesn't allow for the freedom to actually speak, you know, um, to that harm. Um, and then we, uh, before we move on to the next speaker, you know, I was also just, you know, curious about what, what are the outcomes that victims seek? I imagine that they can be surprising. They could be creative, uh, things that judges and lawyers probably would never think of, or, you know, would never emerge, you know, uh, in a, in some sort of legal system. So could you maybe share one story of, um, of a process that led to a resolution that was creative? Well, I think every process results in a creative outcome in that it is co-created by the participants every time. Uh, and that the container that holds that creativity, like the creative constraints that we put on ourselves are simply the values that we co-created again at the beginning. So how are we gonna talk with one another? How are we gonna share? So it's necessarily gonna result in a creative outcome, right? Um, but literally, and then we use art sometimes in the process itself. You know, there's lots of markers and glitter and you know butcher paper and, and drawing the story of what we'd like to see justice look like sometimes. And then in one particular case, uh, there was a survivor who said that she wanted from the person who'd caused her harm um, in lieu of any sort of monetary outcome or any kind of anything she wanted. It was interesting. She had a, a deep attachment to um, the image of a Tinkerbell. And she asked this young man who had, had at some point disclosed that he felt that somebody was asking him, like, what are you good at? Instead of getting in all this trouble, what could you be doing with your time? He says, I'm a really good artist. And his mother said, you can't pay this woman back with your art. Uh, for all this damage that you've done. And she said, oh, oh yes, he can. And she asked him to paint um, a six foot tall Tinkerbell, uh, which, you know, we connected with some community artists and, and uh, he did produce this beautiful piece of artwork and, um, and has stayed out of trouble since. And so instead of asking the question, you know, um, was that tough on crime? I mean, to my mind, is the person who experienced the harm satisfied? And did the person who caused the harm meet their needs in a way uh, that also transformed them. Uh, if that's the answer, then why can't that be what justice looks like? So I would say that. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And we'll get back to you when we um, you know, join as a big group. So next, I'd like to introduce Stiana Van Buren, 
Um, she's the executive director, design director, and co-finder of Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, uh, and is a nationally known advocate for magnifying the role of design in, in ending mass incarceration. So um, you're also very connected to the idea of restorative justice um, and you know, Restore Oakland, which is one of the, your projects um, is built as a first center for restorative justice and restorative economics. Um, in Al so it, the center pieces, feature spaces for Alameda County's restorative justice system, but it also features things that are like incubators for businesses from low income communities of color. And can you describe what does the center look like? And why are these things that aren't often together? Why is it important for them to be located together? Yeah, Prana, that's a great question. Would you like me to describe myself before I begin and describe the space too? Uh, I'm also calling from Oakland, uh, Ohlone territory. Uh, I'm an African-American woman with, with curly corkscrew hair. Uh, I have my signature scarf on and my black sweater. Uh, I'm in my home also filled with plants and art and my big yellow chair. So that's me. And in response to your question, it's, it's, it's a really um, interesting one because we love to segregate uses, right? We love to put this over here and that's the school and this is the hospital and that's the clinic, et cetera. And so Restore Oakland really is in a way, functions in a biophilic way, right? The way nature works, right? Biodiversity we know is powerful, right? That, that brings life. It's really no different when we think about architecture and the places that we make, you know, in communities all over the country, what we've seen is that people want a one-stop shop, right? If you're a mother with a small children, you don't wanna to have to go across town here to go to this, to go to that. You need to co-locate these uses so people can get access to resources in one place. And those things can cross pollinate with one another. So what you're looking at here is the restorative justice space at Restore Oakland in East Oakland um, near the Fruitvale Bart. And this center has a restaurant that trains low wage restaurant workers to get living wage jobs and fine dining. It has beautiful, bright, airy community organizing space. And this space, which is uh, sort of, you see the natural daylight spilling in, uh, it's reflecting off the sort of blue walls. There's uh, an expression wall. Uh, there's a cool off space. People are sitting around a beautiful wood altar in a circle. And this is where restorative justice is happening. So all the things that Sujatha spoke about get played out here, predominantly with young people ages 15 to 21 who are diverted out of court and into this space to have those dialogues to repair that harm. And this space is dedicated to that, right? So it's co-located with these other uses, but there's something sacred, I believe, about spaces for restorative justice, right? That they're not spaces that you want to have a big party in here, right? This is all that happens here. And it happens not just for young people, but for the community can come here to resolve conflict. The community and the building can come here to resolve conflict. So imagine we had spaces like this in all of our pieces of architecture and infrastructure as a way of anchoring restorative justice as a practice. Thank you. Um Another project that um, you know is about to you know become reality is that you've had a multi-year kind of engagement with uh, citizens of Atlanta to turn their detention center uh, into a center for equity, uh, and like Oakland, includes a lot of co-location of different uh, needs. Uh, but you know, in this case. You're not starting from scratch. You're starting from, you know, a building that contains, you know, a lot of historic trauma. Um, it's in one place. Um, how do you get a like? What's the process of getting the community together and to agree on, you know, whether this should be torn down, whether it should be transformed? What are the different pieces that should be here? Could you talk about? You know, it sounds like an amazing idea of transformation, but I also know it can be quite a contentious process with so many different people's visions. And so can you t tell me about how this process resulted in what, what's planned for the Center for Equity? Uh, the, the process that we are committed to and dedicated to, and we use this process for all our projects, it's really important that it be used for the repurposing and reimagining of prisons and jails due to the harm that's been done. But our, our process we call the concept development process uh, engages 
anyone that has a stake in the project. So in a way we embody restorative justice principles that way, right? If the, you're gonna use this building, if you're part of this community, you should be involved in the imagining of it. So we create wonderful games and tools that help the community learn about architecture and design, learn about financing, right? So it's a co-learning process. They're learning about all the things I know. I'm also learning about their wisdom. We translate that uh, visual data into concepts like what you're seeing here, right? So up in the right-hand corner, you're seeing what the jail used to look like. This jail used to house over a thousand men and women, right? And you see these, it's a two-story space in the middle. There's no natural light coming in. You have cells packed in. This is called a direct supervision model. And what we've done is said, look, the community wants these gone, right? We have to demolish all of these cells. And what they want is community space. Right. So imagine turning a space for incarceration where people are detained in cages into a community space that has daycare. Right. So this image shows the double height space now peeled back with light streaming into it. Right. No more cells, beautiful community spaces, like a green play area for young people, small climbing walls, spaces for the community to gather casually, a gym space, right? That we can take these pieces of infrastructure, and mind you, there are hundreds of these around the country that are closing, many in our urban cores, right, the center of our cities. And if we don't repurpose these and engage community and reimagining them, they often get flipped and turn into new spaces of incarceration, right? They become ICE detention facilities, they move different group part, you know, different parties in here. Oh, we're gonna move the women in here, right? You you have to address it. And interestingly enough, in the case of this project. While we showed a repurposing option, what we heard from community is they wanted it to be demolished completely and rebuilt, right? So we did four options for the mayor's office, um, knowing that we did surveys and we had all the data to show that that was the community's preference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, besides kind of thinking about spaces for people to, con you know, community space, there are also different types of infrastructures um, to support folks who are re-entering their communities after being in prison. Um, what type of spaces do those folks need and what does it take to get them built? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, Unfortunately, what you're seeing here are three types of buckets of work that we do. The first image and Restore Oakland showed restorative reinvestments in community. Uh, the Atlanta City Detention Center repurposing is what we call our repurpose and reimagine type of infrastructure. And then another one we call restorative reentry, right? This is the reentry infrastructure required for those coming home. They need a lot of things. And even the first two projects you saw have reentry infrastructure and that access to jobs and job training, jobs that they can get, access to restorative practices and programs. But another thing they obviously need is housing, right? A place to live. You know, we, we have a lot of barriers to formerly incarcerated folks getting adequate housing. We also, you know, in some communities, we don't want those people there and it's called nimbyism, not in my backyard, right? So there's a challenge to locating sites without getting backlash. There's also financing issues. And then when you talk about financing, it's hard to create a beautiful space for folks, right? They've been traumatized for God knows how long. They have to and are often mandated to come into transitional housing. And they are often put in dormitory congregate settings, which we now understand are also just very dangerous for a lot of reasons. And so some of the projects we've been working on are working with black churches to create reentry campuses, right? And communities that they're embedded in and this small unit, this image you're seeing is a small unit, right? So the scale doesn't matter, size never matters, right? We can do huge things, we can do tiny things, as long as they have impact. And this project was like listening to formerly incarcerated men and women hearing like, look, I'm in this space. Like you imagine you have 10 people in a room with a cot, right? And a bedside table. You've been incarcerated for 20 years. You're coming into a situation that's barely better than where you left. And what they said, well, why can't we just have our own private spaces, right? Have some dignity and privacy within this context. And out of that emerged the, this concept with the space you're seeing called mobile refuge rooms. And this is a space you're seeing small rooms made of wood, beautiful wood rooms with sliding doors. Everyone has their own bed, a dresser, a desk where they can work and study surrounding a central space where they can gather in community or even slide open their doors. So, you know, their room can come become part of that community. 
And we've been able to work with folks at Laney College, a local community college we have, where the same folks who helped us design it went there and learned digital fabrication, right? So now we're using our work to help uh, train folks to get living wage jobs, right? So how can we do three things with one thing? And uh, we have a beta in the field, right? A pilot is in the field being used. And we are now working on the business model to begin to produce these at scale. You're on mute, Piranha. I'm sure Sorry, you're saying good stuff. <laughs> no, I was just saying, uh, we're running a little behind. I wanna make sure everybody gets their, you know, um, time to introduce their own projects before we get in discussion. But I know that you, you want to talk about one more uh, project in brief, um, which is um, the work you're planning in Detroit as a campus. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Love Campus and and how, how does this fit into the work that you've already done and take it to a different place, perhaps? Yeah, this is our, our execution of our business model, right? So we are going to develop our own projects now, right? As architects and real estate developers, we were, this project was uh, ignited by Restore Oakland in, in phase one of the Love Building in Detroit, right? Similar kind of multi-use hub. And we're just gonna expand that idea, right? So these are several buildings that will have both hospitality housing for formerly incarcerated folks coming home. We have workforce development hub here. We have a food ecosystem and a restaurant, daily needs, social retail and arts and culture anchor education and literacy space, spaces for youth, uh, alternative justice spaces, right? So imagine all of the things that we've been developing all this time coming into one campus. And we're also looking at community ownership, right? So crowdsource funding, giving the community equity in a project and really challenging what equitable development looks like. It's a very exciting project for us. And I hope that folks would follow along and see see what equitable development really looks like when we look to end mass incarceration. Thank you so much, Deanna, for for sharing such complicated programs in, in such a short. <laughs> uh, do my best. I do my best. Right. <laughs> but hopefully, it's Thank given you. our audience, um, you know, a taste of of, this, of the different types of things that that need to be built in place. Right. That's it's right. not just about demolishing or taking down those structures, but right. figuring out what needs to be built in their place. Um, so um, I'm gonna move to our next speaker. Um, thank you, Deanna. Um, Maria Gaspar is an interdisciplinary artist based in Chicago whose work addresses issues of spatial justice in order to amplify, mobilize, or divert structures of power through individual and collective gestures. Maria, do you wanna introduce yourself, give a little visual description first, and then I'll ask you your first question. Sure, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm a Latinx person, first generation Mexican American with light brown skin, um, black hair in a bun, wearing a patterned blouse. And I'm zooming in from my home office in Chicago, which is located on traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Adawa, Potawatomi nations, many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho Chunk, Menemone, Sac, and Fox, also call this area home. So thank you for, for having me. Thanks, Maria. So for the better part of a decade, you've explored social constructions of space and the connection between body and place and power. Um, and many of your projects are often related to Cook County Jail, uh, which I know you have a personal connection to. Um, can you explain this concept of spatial justice? How are these two things connected? How, how are what people do, you know, through their movement, through performance, through community projects connected to justice? Yeah, so I, um, I grew up a few blocks away from Cook County Jail, which is um, considered uh, to be the largest single site jail in the country. Um, and, you know, as part of a community process with many different stakeholders from the area surrounding the jail, um, and other people that were uh, affected by incarceration from that particular jail and others um, became really interested in thinking about how the jail is simultaneously visible and invisible. Um, and really thinking about the kind of um, saturatedness of the jail and density, because you know at the time when we started working there, it was 2012 and there were about 13,000 people um, uh, locked up and, um, and thinking about the connections between, you know, the, the density of a, of a place of incarceration and 
um, the subtraction of community members from our neighborhood um, through the various forms of, of state violence, um, ICE raids um, in particular because of uh, you know, the neighborhood being a predominantly immigrant community, um, but also other forms of policing. So we were beginning to really think about those connections um, around, you know, what does the ecology of our community look like? And what does it mean that, you know, the largest architecture of our neighborhood is a jail? And it was through that lens that we started working um, on, a, on a long process of using art and interventions um, as a form of of uh, disruption, but also um, in the production of, of new knowledge and new kinds of narratives that we hope kind of push against um, these notions of you know, criminality and who gets criminalized. As we know, you know the majority of, of people that are incarcerated are Black and Latinx people and other marginalized groups. Um, and so really thinking about um, this jail as uh, as sort of enacting a series of erasures um, became part of, of, of the conversation. Um, so, I, you know, for me, art is, is you know, has this possibility of, of disrupting um, a particular kind of carceral logic or, or a power um, dominance, um, especially in relationship to like where it's located and thinking about its resonance beyond you know, not not only looking at the community that 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 it exists in, but also um, the county, you know, um, the city, uh, the state, right, the country. Um, so, so for me, I think so much about how public space shapes public identity, and through these public art actions, um, we started developing, you know, a, a conversation around what does it mean um, to both see. Uh, this this jail and also unsee it and how can art play a role in uh, unpacking that? Yeah, I mean the this picture, for example, you know, features this wall um, of the Cook County Jail, which is an important site of many of your works. Could you talk a little bit about uh, why the wall? And you know, obviously, it creates an inside and an outside, and it, and it's mm -hmm. something that's. A physical feature, you know, everyday feature mm -hmm. of um, of the neighborhood, but as a, a space for making work or or you know the interface between you know the community and the folks who are inside. Mm -hmm. uh, how how has the wall been used in some of your projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember years ago one of our um, community members said something um, so powerful. And she was working inside of the prison um, doing social justice work um, through the Adler School of Psychology. And she, when I asked her, you know, early on, what is the color, you know, what, what are sort of the colors that come to mind when you think about, you know, the interior of the jail or, or the jail itself? She said, there is no color, the color is concrete. And I started to think so much about how, um, you know, that the way that she described uh, color is through uh, a tangible, very solid, almost impenetrable material. And, and that not only can you imagine its, its color and its um, impermeability, uh, you can also feel it. You know, you can really feel what that means. Um, so the wall uh, over the years, um, you know, has become this, this opportunity to think of it as a sort of amplification device. Um, and thinking about how art can make the wall porous, um, that you know, through these artistic um, actions using theater with, you know, you creating theater with formerly in incarcerated people or um, producing um, sound transmissions through, you know, series of interviews with community members where they talk about their own connection to incarceration and transcending that sound through the wall, you know became a space to, to cross, you know, to visually, sonically um, uh, cross a place that, you know, is so fixed. And, you know, I also think about, often I've been, you know, thinking so much about the wall as inside outside, but also as interior and exterior, you know, and thinking about how interior and exterior also extends to the body, you know, the there's an exterior part of ourselves and then there's a, this interior life that we have and you know how can the you know the artwork both express um the 
the architecture, but also express um, the expressions that come with, you know, um, you know, a, a, a social, ex, uh, you know, and political ex experience that is amplified by, you know, our mass incarceration, you know, crisis. Um, and, you know, when I think about uh, the work of my colleagues here on this panel, um, Diana, and also thinking about Marking Time, the book by um, Nicole Fleetwood, um, you know, the way that um, these spaces also, you know, create a certain kind of omnipresence, um, you know, within the community, a certain a, a kind of set of stigmas that, that um, really act on both sides. I wanted to really think about how working with people on the outside, but also working with people on the inside can begin to, um, in a way, take that wall down, you know, and, and think of it almost like a, a process of abolition. Uh, how can we imagine a process of abolition and how can this play a role in that process? Well, I mean, that's, that's part of the thing that we're talking about is, is, is how do we move from thinking of something as fixed as to something that we can actually engage or change mm -hmm. or alter uh, work across. And um, so, you know, many of these projects are different ways of trying to do that. Um, and over the course of, you know, he said more than almost a decade or more than a decade right now, there must be an incredible web of relationships that you have built both, you know, in terms of people in the system, you know, working for the city or for, mm -hmm. um, corrections that you've had to engage with on one side, community members, um, folks who are actually been incarcerated or are incarcerated currently and different nonprofits and groups that are working like how, you know, there's the project that's the series of artworks and then just the project of the relationship making mm -hmm. that develops over time. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you, you have a story you can share quickly about kind mm -hmm. of a relationship that developed and maybe wouldn't have, or, you know, between people or mm -hmm. communications that wouldn't have happened um, without them working together on this project. Yeah, absolutely. I have so many stories, <laughs> but I, I will, I will just pick one. And, um, and it's, it's one that, that I re remember so, um, so well, because it was at the beginning of, of doing this uh, project where we were just sort of imagining the possibilities and, and, and kind of not sure in what direction the project was going to go. And, um, and I think it coincides with the fact that, you know, communities are not monolithic. Um, you know, it, it's made up of different kinds of fragments, um, different kinds of political positions and um, and it's yeah comprised of you know businesses and jail staff who sometimes are also you know people who live in the community right outside of the jail. Um, it consists of community community leaders and and incarcerated people. It's it's just yeah so many people. But I remember early on um, uh, one of the the elders of our community who has been a big supporter of this work and many other projects. Um, had imagined that the project can be a beautification project where um, I think she desired and, and maybe others like some of the local businesses desired um, for a group of artists to create some kind of band-aid over the jail because I think many people felt like it was an eyesore and they didn't want to be reminded um, of, of this place of incarceration. And I think it, it really led to some um, rich conversations where we had to really think about and talk about things like, um, you know, uh, abolition to talk about um, thinking critically about our relationship, our own complicity in the carceral state, um, whether we knew it or not. Um, and also even, you know, things like aesthetics, you know, that, uh, that, that, that are not exclusive to, you know, the field of art, you know, that, that notions of beauty and aesthetics are very much um, embedded in our everyday, and that you know this elder in the community and others um, have a stake in that too. And so it, we had to really work through a whole slew of conversations about what that means, about meaning and making, um, and public space, and and I think those un unlikely collaborations led to some really generative uh, moments. Thank you, Maria. Um, we are running a little bit late 
but we definitely are going to make time for a, a group conversation. But I want to um, move now to, to our final speaker, Dr. Nicole Fleetwood, um, who, as you mentioned, Maria, is a writer and a curator and also a professor of American studies at Rutgers uh, and art history at Rutgers University. Uh, she's the author of Marking Time, Art and the Age of Mass Incarceration and the curator of an exhibit um, of the same name currently on view at MoMA PS1 in New York. Um, so uh, Nicole, could you please do a quick self-description and then I'll ask you your first question. Hi, I'm Nicole Fleetwood. I'm a black woman. My hair is up in braids, I'm wearing glasses. I was born and raised in the Midwest on the land of the Mitamsa people, and I'm currently in um, New York on unceded territory of the Lenape. And I want to just thank all the labor and, and dreaming that made this panel possible. Thank you, Nicole. So I thought what Maria said about the different relationships really was a good kind of bridge to your own uh, methodology that, you know, your way of uh, writing about art made, you know, in incarcerated environments um, is not just a compendium or an encyclopedia. It's really about the relationships that you had uh, or you developed with 70 artists who, um, you know, have experienced incarceration. And I think it's interesting that it's a combination of techniques. It's personal on one level. It's about you and your personal relationship to um, to the system and to people who've been inside. It's it's sociological, it's political analysis. Can you tell me how you managed to kind of put all of these kind of strands together in your book and how it connects to your own sense of who the work is for, whom the work is for and who's it accountable to? Thank you. And so first of all, I want to say all the, it's been great hearing everyone else talk. And I also want to acknowledge my virtual background, which is a um, installation shot from PS1, I'm actually in my apartment. Um, and it includes Maria's um, work on the wall in conversation with Jesse Crimes. Um, and um, it's six of the images, uh, digital images, collages from um, her Cook County projects where you, um, if you could see the, the detail, you'd see the kind of way she's talking about creating porosity and conversation across the carceral divide. Um, and I also want to say that like, for me, what brings this, like all of this work together and marking time is not just one, it's not one, it's not a book, it's not an exhibition, it's, it's kind of ongoing collaboration. And to me, it's rooted in the Black radical tradition that we have to dream the world that we want to live in. And for me, we have to dream it from like whatever site we're occupying. Um, and at the center of my book are people held in punitive captivity who are dreaming other ways of, of you know, inhabiting life and being in conversation with people and belonging and recognition. And so I think for me, what's what grounds the methodology is being a student and learning for, from people who are who are directly impacted and who are creating new avenues for making art and literally new ways of coming together uh, to form community, um, again, across the carceral divide. And so you're looking at um, an image of detail from the work by Mark Glotney, who's currently in prison in Pennsylvania. And over a six year period, he's done this incredible study of incarceration again from the side of someone held in captivity where he asked other incarcerated people to sit for him for 20 minutes and does these incredible sketches and right now he's up to 700 images um and you know and these images have so much to teach us about you know every individual who who um comprises of this you know this larger system of million many millions of people who've lost their not only their freedom but their rights as a result of our criminal legal system. And you you chose to focus in terms of organizing your book on the common conditions under which art is made in prison. And you, you kind of have this tripartite structure of penal space, penal time, and penal matter. Can you explain these three categories? Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. And in doing that, I'd like to say like my primary audience, I, there's multiple <laughs> audiences, but in writing the book, I was writing for pe the people who shared with me. And I was able to work, Harvard worked with Art for Justice Fund to have a special edition of the book, a paperback sent um, gratis to incarcerated people. So my very first readers were in, in prison people who were writing me before it had been released, released to the general audience. 
and that was for me, like that was all the kind of recognition that I needed is that my, my, my goal was to see the people and to treat people with utmost respect and care and to honor their process. Um, and to have artists in conversation again across this kind of this idea of a divide to actually think about community more complexly and not let the carceral state defines how we are in conversation. And so that's why Maria is very much Maria's work right now is in conversation with Jesse Crimes, who was in prison, and they're both doing really incredible work where they're also in, in, engaging kind of aerial um, the kind of aerial space also as another lens through which we can think about this kind of built environment that we've created around carcerality. And just thinking about the conditions of making art in prison, I thought about like the space, the actual constraints of being in a six foot by nine cell or working in a, you know, a community room or maybe a, a makeshift um, art studio. Um, but I also thought about if you go to the next slide, the kind of spatial relations and the intimate relations that get structured through imprisonment. And I think that's captured really beautifully by this work by Tamika Cole, who was in prison for 26 years in Alabama. And she would create these amazing graphite collages as literally a way of pro producing her own space of survival, especially when she was dealing with abuses by the uh, by prison staff. So the space is, yes, the built environment, but it's all, also the way that prison structures psychic and social relations. Um, and then with penal time, I was thinking about, you know, this this way that we in our current criminal legal system measure out punishment. And it was so inspired by the earlier presentations on forms of transformative justice, because right now we use time as a measurement of punishment. And it's so arbitrary. And it's also a modern device that we say, you did this, you did X. And so therefore you get 15 years, right? Like there's, so it's, what does that do? And so we, I don't think we've really thought through as a society that kind of use of time and then how that time becomes this kind of existential and embodied experience from imprisoned people who like, they wake up, they brush their teeth, they're being punished. They eat lunch, they're being punished. They're sleeping, you know, so, and, and the way that that also um, leaves with them as part of the kind of post-traumatic stress of, of being in prison, in prison is the way that time has been regulated. Um, so in art, imprisoned people will often use, manage um, that time in the service of creation. And then if you go to the next slide, I get at the idea of penal matter, which is like all the material constraints that imprisoned people have to make art and the ways that they improvise with, you know, state materials, with found items, they create colors using, um, you know, whatever they have available, hair gel, uh, Kool-Aid, coffee. Um, and this is a work by Gilberto Rivera called An Institutional Nightmare, where he uses, uses his state issued federal uniform or clothing, state issue clothing. A lot of people don't want it to be referred to as a uniform. And also what, his, what was extracted out of him while he was in prison, he, his job was to mop floors. And so he's incorporated like wax from, from mopping. His labor is actually um, part of this process as well as the signature of the warden. And can you tell me why you felt it's important to write artists who are in prison into contemporary art, you know, or the con discourse of contemporary right. art or art history. Um, oftentimes, you know, people have put it in a box and said it's outsider art or it's, or it's our therapy, you know, um, and not given it its due as, as, as art and as a form of, you know, creation that has its own kind of aesthetic value. And so how does seeing this work in the context that you've laid it out um, and shared with the world. How, how does it change how we think of artists and culture makers, not just in prison ones? Right, I mean, it's a couple of things and I, I'll just, just for, for brevity's <laughs> sake, I'll say one of the things that was interesting, very important to me was to think about culture being made um, in critical ways, like the work of Maria about the, the just expansiveness of the car carceral state and also work coming from inside prison that just radically re structures reimagines how how we think about the visual culture of prisons because the visual culture of the prisons are is often one that just reproduces a kind of penal spectatorship which michelle brown a sociologist describes where we actually follow follow the logic of imprisonment and that when we see these spectacular documentaries and docudramas that it actually 
um, a, allows a viewer to agree with this project of locking up many millions of people. And so I was interested in work that was actually doing something that very much radically challenged that. And, and in doing that, I, I got much more interested in thinking about the parallel relationships between prisons and the art museum and how prisons are also an aesthetic project that's about the devaluation of certain populations and how this work is actually um, a refusal to, to even engage with those terms. Mm -hmm. And how has it perhaps felt for now that it is in a museum? It's in it's in MoMA PS one. Yeah. So, um, how does how have the artists who you know the incarcerated artists who are part of the show felt about being exhibited in in museums? And um, what has how has that changed how they make art? Yeah, I mean, and and honestly, with the in amount of to, to <laughs> out of respect for the our other <laughs> panelists, that's a big question. But I, what I want to say is that it's it's produced so many conversations and opportunities for people, and that it I, and what I love about it is that it's it's not my project; it's a collaborative project that people have taken in so many different ways. Like Mary Baxter, who's in the audience, has started to curated a talk, a speaking series called Chosen Family, because a lot of the artists in Marking Time are now identifying as Chosen Family. They're curating shows together, they're creating art together. And so like, for me, just that that is the joy of it, is that this is not about the centrality of one person as curator or author, but it's about really envisioning the kind of community and collaboration and, just society that we want to live in through, and I think it happens on the local. Um, but yeah, it is astounding for all of us that we have a show at PS1. <laughs> we're, we're all happy and kind of astounded by it. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to just ask everyone to come back together. I know we, we hopefully, if you are able, I know we're almost at time, but if, if folks can stay for another 10 minutes um, to wrap this up as a group. Um, so a lot of the questions that perhaps people who aren't working in the system as directly or you know around the system as directly as you uh, might be wondering um you know are there moments cultural shifts that you can point to you know we have just you know had a, a moment of uprisings in the street against police brutality people are talking about defunding the police um in ways that I think in, on a much more mainstream level, perhaps. And um, does that give you hope about how perhaps, you know, there is a bigger reawakening of thinking about, you know, what is safety and what is justice um, and what are what is possible as alternatives or are there other, that's the big thing that I can point to, but I'm sure that we all experience um, cultural shifts and moments and experiences that may give us hope. So I wanted to give an opportunity for you to name them if, if you have any that you want to speak to. I can jump in with a big one for us. Um, as soon as uh, we heard about George Floyd's murder and we started to see these sort of uprisings, the ability that we had to develop this infrastructure increased tremendously because for the first time we started to see capital flowing into black and brown communities in a way that I, I had never seen before. Um, and, and that comes with its own challenges in terms of capacity and readiness to receive that capital. But we are now able to fight for some real dollars to come into communities after centuries of disinvestment, literally centuries of disinvestment. So that's a very optimistic shift that we've seen very recently. Anyone else want to jump in? For that. I, I can answer this is Sujatha. I would echo um, what Deanna is saying. Um, there's definitely more seats at the table. Um, whether or not they are the correct tables or that the tables are asking the right questions is a separate issue. Um, but um, I feel that sort of the edges of what is being asked for in terms of um, moving towards a liberation framework uh, instead of uh, power over framework is something that people are are starting to get their brains around people who've traditionally held power over are starting to understand. Um, there's also just more of a, a generalized awareness of the failures of the pre-existing uh, criminal legal system that I think didn't exist before, and a slight opening of the door towards eroding uh, the idea that 
there are good guys and bad guys instead of people trying to acknowledge that folks inside, uh, you know, incarcerative facilities actually are also all survivors of some form of violence. Um, so these are some of the things that are giving me hope about sort of this very, um, again, binary narrative that's existed. Um, and, and I think just generally, I think about Mariam Kaba's work um, in calling us all to keep hope as a practice and that kind of optimism that comes uh, from communities who have been at this and abolitionists who've been at this for a really long time. The, the fact that there have been people who've been doing this um, in the face of so much opposition for so many decades, um, particularly queer and trans folks um, for decades uh, have been holding this down. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, and maybe just, because, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, go I ahead. just, um, uh, Mariam Kaba has also been very influential to so many people in Chicago since she was, <laughs> um, she really touched so many people here. She touches, I should say, so many people here. Um, but I remember one of the, one of the most, um, many powerful things she says, but one thing I remember the most is, when she said, you know, um, you know, whatever tool you have at your disposal, you really should use it, you know, whether you're an artist or an educator or, um, you know, a scholar or, or whatever, a mother, right, that you use any tool you can, um, you know, to, to work against uh, mass incarceration, right, and state violence. And I, um, that was really refreshing to hear because sometimes, you know, uh, as an artist or creating artwork, um, you know, there, there is this sense of, uh, you know, questioning of its value, right? Like, what is it really doing? <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that her words really uh, are, are so important in, in really getting all of us to think about our own role in this and how we can push this forward. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I'm thinking also, you know, this is a, a policy discussion. So I want to, while none of you are necessarily policy wonks, <laughs> I'm all of you have, you know, studied the history of how policy really impacts and has allowed this system to grow. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, we're, even though a lot of criminal justice policy is at the state level, um, you know, there is a new administration federally, is there, you know, what can, the Biden administration do? What can the Democratic Congress do uh, on that level um, to move away from mass incarceration? Does anyone want to take that? I can take that. This is Sujatha speaking. And, um, you know, first and foremost, again, yes, you're so correct that most of what needs to happen is at the state level. Uh, and, um, you know, who is incarcerated federally is just a micro percentage of what is happening nationally in the United States. And um, there are things both symbolic and, and concrete that can happen. First and foremost, I think we could just get rid of that federal death penalty is a good place to start. These They're levers and we don't understand the degree to which each an individual lever can, can, can cause the whole thing to shift and ideally tumble uh, someday. And um, so commutations, uh, pardons, um, you know, tomorrow, we could just have no federal death row, like that could happen tomorrow. That's a kind of unilateral power that the federal government has. Um, I also think about money. Um, and again, raising Deanna's um, point about where the dollars flowing to. Uh, historically, most of the money around solutions at the community level um, for, to uh, crime and harm and and wrongdoing that happen within our communities has to flow through some relationship with the current, current criminal legal system, right? So all of these big federal grants uh, are, happen in partnership with the police, with DAs, et cetera. What would it look like to uh, acknowledge that the government is um, really not proven to us that they are capable of, of ending harm um, and to have these grants go to artists and go to the things that crime survivors when surveyed actually are asking for, which is, um, better resources in our community, trauma and recovery centers, restorative justice programs, transformative justice, um, you know, community accountability uh, processes. Uh, what would it look like to fund those things instead? Uh, the current, like for example, the Violence Against Women Act should never have been at the Department of Justice. It should have been at Health and Human Services, right? Um, and so these are the kinds of things that the federal government could change that could uh, be beneficial. So those are just some initial thoughts. There are probably a million more things that, again, it's not my area of expertise, but some of the things that come to mind. Anyone else that want to take that? 
or I mean, I have a related question, perhaps. Um, you know, we were talking um, when we had our prep call. Um, you know, and I think this is Miriam Miriam Kaba as well about you know what reforms are non-reformist and what reforms like lead to the perpetuation of the system. Um, you know, a lot of things like electronic monitoring, you know, uh, monitoring and things that actually increase surveillance in our communities sound like there's less people inside, right, in, in, inside detention, but in what it actually does is, is create many more opportunities for people um, to, to, you know, get tripped in the, the technicalities, right, of parole or et cetera, you know. So I'm just wondering, like, what are the things that, that you would say are, you know, like, how would you make those distinctions? How would you know something is actually a, a reform that would help shrink the system versus expand the system? Because it feels like that's actually a challenge for a lot of people, and especially people who might be well-meaning, but maybe not necessarily, you know, in the know about how the systems per perpetuate themselves. Anyone want to I can share how we do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a policy wonk, as you said, I'm not an expert in that. So we follow the community organizers, right, who tell us and are doing the research, who are on the ground and that, Deanna, this is not good. You don't want to do that. That's not going to get us where we need to be. I listen to them. I don't pretend to be an expert on it. It's super sticky, super tricky. There's a million gray areas and I, there are just certain folks that I trust that's where I get my news from, that's where I make my decisions on, like the Justice LA Coalition, Racial Justice Action Center, Women on the Rise, Andrea James out of Boston, ending mass incarceration for women and girls. These people know what's up, I just call them. Should I do this? They're like, no, I'm like, I back way off. <laughs> as soon as they tell me what to do. I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for. Like, I call my friends. No, I mean, I think that is definitely something that, that I think it's the humility of that there's a lot that we don't know. And there's a lot of things that we could be supporting that sound good on paper or that sound like we're, you know, is moving us forward that may not. And that we really do need to take the time to do the research um, and to find our trusted resources, you know, of information. Nicole, did you want to jump in? You look like you were. Yeah, I'm not a policy person at all. And, you know, um, but I was just, as I was listening to Deanna, what she said, I was just thinking that, you know, just any, I think when often we're, we're in the mindset of, of scarcity, then we're like constantly looking for opportunity and trying to claim something. And, and if we're more fixated on like trying to just ma maintain an institution or grow an institution, that could be completely a, a disservice to like what we should be committed to, which is like ending carcerality and like re, re, re envisioning. And so I think ultimately it's really about a lot of organizations, their goal should be working to the for the demise of their organization, that their organization is no longer needed and that it can transform into something else. It doesn't mean that they're not needed, but that they can transform into other forms of community care. And I don't think it's just community, I think it's like psychic care. I think it's like working, how do we treat people in our home? I mean, to me, abolition starts with like, what do, how do we in, in, interact with people when we get up in the morning? Um, and, and, you know, putting that into practice. But I think that that also, leads us to just like going after certain things that we shouldn't be going after. Yeah. Looking for new models of coming together and new models of funding, you know? Well, thank you all. I think we've hit our kind of 10 minutes um, over time. And I just want to um, send my appreciation to all of the speakers today. Um, I know that sometimes I've asked some questions that aren't in your comfort zone because it's a it's a policy discussion but I think we all are being asked to stretch ourselves uh, and and to Maria's point to 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 use what we know but also to stretch ourselves um, in terms of of where our knowledge is coming from and to think about um, all the different interconnections um, between us and the system that has tentacles in so many directions through our lives. So thank you for revealing that and for sharing all the creative ways and the difficult ways and long-term ways that you all are doing this work. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand the mic back to Solana to say some closing words.
thinking about in terms of like how do we care for each other how do we are there for each other um and what does justice mean and and for all of us so um thank you everyone thank you sensibly at wixville for your partnership to our civic programs i team marketing and development teams um, to our VX team that um, takes care of our, our visitors in person. Um, I want to thank uh, very especially our access workers tonight who did a wonderful job. I want to invite everyone to check out um, past and future conversations that were part of this uh, program. We have two series, This Culture Meets Policy and um, Pindel's Legacy. We also have an amazing audio uh, piece called Fighting Dark that um, you shouldn't miss. It's, um, it starts near the shed and goes downtown and to Brooklyn. Um, and to close, once again, I want to thank um, the Ford Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their um, generous support of this commission and our public programs, the Howard Gilman Foundation for providing the Zoom platform um, that we use for this evening's conversation. And if it's safe for you to do so, we invite you to attend Howardina Pindel Rope Fire Water in person at the shed. It's open through the end of March. This weekend, it's free admission. So take advantage of that. And thanks again for joining us. Good night, everyone.